not just to get the game, but this is more than that. It's pretty cool. For user activated soft fork, it's a nifty little idea that plans to take power of decision away from the miners and into the hands of the market that has many fans and proponents. There are however many others with reservations, as it is very situational and, despite its name, it still relies in part on the cooperation of miners in order to be a success. Otherwise we may potentially find ourselves in a bigger mess than we originally started out in, with two different versions of a coin coexisting. UASF as an idea is not entirely new, in fact we had something similar in 2012 when pay to script hash was introduced into Bitcoin. However its current proposal by Litecoin core developer Shaolin Fry in the form of BIP148 is slightly different in its approach, although the goal is still the same, to pressure change through the use of nodes. A node is defined as any device that connects to the network, and a full node is one that possesses a full copy of the blockchain. These full nodes play an important role in helping keep the network decentralised, allowing mobile wallets to work through simple payment verification, and helping protect the network against cyber and double spending attacks. Most importantly however, they enforce the rules and check each block mined to make sure it follows them. If a block does not follow the rules, it will be rejected from the blockchain. A flag day as we had in 2012 is simply a date on which these full nodes begin enforcing the rules across the network, ready or not. So then, it's not technically a UASF as despite what others may say, no soft fork is actually meant to occur. Although, without the proper preparations and precautions being put into place, issues could potentially arise depending on how contested and controversial the changes are, and the wider context surrounding it at the time. BIP-148, or UASF as it has now come to be known, is a method to apply economic pressure upon miners to force them to signal change. In this case, through the existing method of a 95% mining consensus requirement as set up in SegWit specification BIP-141. Come midnight on August 1st UTC, the blockchain would split into Legacy and UASF, old rules and new rules. However, unlike a conventional soft fork, the new UASF chain will enforce a rule that it will only 1. Accept blocks mined with a version bit of 1 and 2. Only accept signalling blocks that build on top of other signalling blocks. On the other hand, the legacy chain will continue to accept blocks with and without this version bit. This means that eventually there will be a discrepancy in where coins are located, as transactions in non-signaling blocks will not appear on the UASF chain. Not to mention the greater the number of transactions, the quicker and more likely it is that the chains will get out of sync, and the less likely it is that transactions will end up occurring on the legacy chain, as it will start rejecting blocks with this version bit because transactions within it will not match their own records, and are thus incompatible with their version of events. This would of course all be fine if it were a hard fork where this split becomes permanent, but if the UASF is successful, or even becomes longer, i.e. has more blocks within it during this time, it will overwrite the legacy chain, reversing any previous payments on it and resyncing the chains once more. This is obviously a pretty big economic concern and is known as double spending. Anyone accepting payments in non-signalling blocks would be putting themselves at great risk of monetary loss. Only by ensuring payments are made to them within signalling blocks and thus on both chains, can a receiver be sure they will not be out of pocket if the UASF is successful. On the other hand, if it does fail and this split ends up becoming permanent, users will have just sent X amount of coins on both chains, effectively paying twice which isn't in any buyer's interests. As such, we are most likely going to see stricter rules enforced by certain services and a slowdown on the network as less people make transactions as everyone waits for this entire situation and UASF to resolve itself. The second thing here to note is that the user in UASF does not just refer to nodes, who started the entire process by splitting the chain. It also refers to the market who now have a job of finishing it and bringing everything back together. 
Depending on how long this process lasts, exchanges may begin to list both chains for trading. Either the futures market, which is safer for traders, and bets on the future price of the chains, or by trading directly upon the chains themselves, which would represent the actual price, but be far riskier for traders, as coins on the legacy chain just may cease to exist. This fact alone will most likely only serve to add further downward pressure on the price, as risk takers hedge their bets and others look to increase their holdings on the safer UASF chain. If the legacy chain becomes priced so low that it is simply not sustainable for miners to support it, they will be forced to follow the money and signal for change. Or they could of course just go bankrupt. If it goes the other way however, and the legacy chain earns enough economic support, we will most likely see miners coordinate to split the chain permanently, as they look to protect theirs and others' investments on the legacy chain from being destroyed. This is why in BIP 148, the market is the ultimate decider. A UASF would not have been called unless there was a strong reason and belief to think that the markets would fall decisively against the miners refusing to signal for change. But don't expect them to take it lying down. For sure it looks bad for them, but they are not completely powerless. And leading that charge is Ji Han Wu, CEO of Bitmain, a company which produces some of the best mining equipment currently out there. They also happen to own Antpool, a Bitcoin mining pool which controls 16% of a network hash rate, making them the biggest, and single-handedly powerful enough to stop the UASF from being successful so long as they refuse to signal readiness. Jimmy Song, a Bitcoin developer, did a rather interesting and insightful write-up on Bitmain and their approximate profitability. He ended up settling on a figure of around 200 to 250 million dollars just for the last financial year. Now that would certainly give him enough capital to put up one hell of a protest, where others may not have been able to. They've also announced their contingency plan for a user-activated hard fork, or UAHF, which plans to permanently split the chain so that it exists independently and without fear of being overwritten. However, even a company as big as Bitmain are still dependent on a market to recognise that chain as having any real value, and the biggest US-based service and exchange, Coinbase and GDAX, have already ruled out any kind of support for this chain, which is certainly a major blow to its legitimacy. Despite this, however, Bitmain have publicly stated that they plan to mine it persistently and ignore all short-term economic incentives, as they believe a roadmap including the option to adjust block size will serve users better, so we expect it to attract a higher market price in the long term. That is all hypothetical however, and how their plans will actually play out in practice is certainly not certain. What we do know however is that when a UASF is commenced and a UAHF, mining hash rate becomes split between the multiple chains, leading to a further slowdown for users on the network. For you see, in order to keep block times and confirmation times consistent, the network has something called a difficulty that automatically readjusts every set number of blocks depending on how many or how few people are mining. When a certain percentage of the network drops off and moves to support the other chain, those remaining will be stuck with a disproportionately high difficulty, resulting in block times potentially quadrupling, depending on how severe this drop off is. This will of course all eventually resolve itself when the network does finally get that opportunity to readjust its difficulty. However, in the interim, with many people already currently paying over the odds in order to send funds anywhere, we may see a further decline in the price of a chain, as more people struggle to send, receive, and generally use their coins. We may see many even sell into other digital assets such as Litecoin, just so they do not have to worry about the effects of the UASF during this time, thus contributing to a further decline in the dominance and price of the main chain. Markets however are fickle things and what will actually happen in practice in this case is not 100% certain. On the other hand, I as always will certainly see you next time.